recording and share my screen. All right, so um, last week we sort of ran out of time and I was still talking about um, data frames or getting ready to talk about data frames. And so we'll just jump in right there. So last week we talked about some simple data structures. One of them was vectors. And I said, uh, pretty much everything is a vector or at least things that some things even that you think are simple are actually really vectors. Um, and then we also talked about list, which is another kind of data structure. Um, and the main difference between vectors and lists is that the type of data that you put in a vector has to be the same kind in every slot, whereas in a list, uh, each of the items in the list can be a different kind of thing. So um, there is a, an additional kind of data structure that is super common in R, which is called a data frame. And a data frame is actually kind of like a combination of a list and a vector. So one of the ways you can think about a data frame is you can think of it as a list where each item in the list is a vector. And if we want to think about it in terms of a table, the list items are the columns of the table and each one of those columns is a vector. So if you think about how we normally use tables, typically um, a particular column is only going to have one kind of thing in it, which makes sense um, with the restriction that a vector has to have only one kind of thing in it. So in this example here, the number legs column, which is essentially a vector, has all numbers in it. And then the group and animal, which contains the name of the kind of group and the name of the animal, all of the items in that column are the same type, which is a, a string or a character object. We also, I also mentioned that one of the things that we typically do for a list items is to give names to the um, items in the list. And in this case, since the items in the list are columns, we can provide a name for each column. And so if we want to reference particular items in the table, like a particular slot, there's actually two ways that we can do it. We can use the square bracket notation that we saw for vectors, only instead of putting a single number in the square bracket, we can put um, a, a two numbers, which represent the uh, row, which is the first number, and the column, which is the second number. So row two, column one, which would be arachnid, we would write this way. Um, the other thing that you can do, if you want to refer to the column by its name, you can use this dollar sign notation, which I think we mentioned in terms of lists. So if you have a named item in a list, <clears throat> you can use that weird um, double, square bracket thing to refer to it by its position, but it's way more common to refer to it by its name. And when we use that notation, we have a dollar sign and then the name of the item. So the table name, which is organism info, then we have a dollar sign and then the column, which is animal. And then the um, index number that's in square brackets here would be the row of that column. The column headers are not really considered to be rows of the table. They're considered to be basically separate things. They're considered to be the names. So when we count one, two, three, four, we don't count the column header. So um, as I said, you can think of a data frame as a list of vectors, and we can actually create a vector uh, sorry, we can actually create a data frame by simply taking a number of vectors and then putting them together in, to create a data frame. So in this example here, um, I have, I use the construct function to construct um, a vector, which is the first column, and then construct a vector, which is the second column, and then construct a vector, which is the third column. And then I use this data.frame function to take my three columns that I've created and put them together into a data frame called organism info. So 
this relationship between columns of tables and vectors is like a really important one because we can actually um, treat columns of tables um, and perform operations on them just as if they were vectors. Uh, in fact, if we have, let's say we have a column with 10 items in it and we have a separate vector with 10 items in it, we can perform pairwise operations on those pair, 10 items between the separate vector and the items in the column, just like we could do with two separate vectors. We talked about that last week. This is one of the things that R does really well, which is to sort of automatically do things in a pairwise fashion to all the items in a vector. Okay, so let's go ahead and if I can get our studio to come up, we can go ahead and so uh, just as a reminder, the way that I got here was from the um, vanderbilt.lt slash r page. Go down to, we're still finishing lesson two. So the lesson two r script, um, you, there's a script, click on the raw button, select the whole thing, copy, and then you can just paste it into a new um, editor window inside our studio. So that's what I did to get to this point so far. So here's the first command that I said, which is to take, um, use a construct uh, function to create one vector called group. Now I'm going to create the vector called animal and the v vector called number legs. And you can see as I create each vector, they show up in this uh, environment window over here. And then when I click on the command to create the data frame out of it, it also shows up. But as in the case of lists, the environment pane doesn't show you everything that's in there because it's too complicated to show as just a single row. But if I click on the name, now it will show me the data frame as one of the um, tabs in my editor window. And I can see that it is displaying it as a table, which is the way that we typically think of data frames. And then here are the examples I had on the slide. If I want to see, uh, or I guess these weren't on the slide. If I want to see the entire animal column, I can just do that. And so here I see bee, frog, spider, and worm. Uh, if I want item in row two, column one, I can ask for it that way. Uh, and if I want row four in the animal column, I can do it this way and I get B. Okay, so that's basically what we saw in the slide. So one of the very convenient things that you can do with a, a data frame is to basically read it in as a, um, let's see, we already did this. Uh, oh, I forgot this part. Um, yeah. So if you want to see what's in a data frame, there are several functions. Head shows you the first six row, tails shows you the last six rows, names gives you the column names, and then str, you might think stands for string if you're used to other languages, but in this case, it stands for structure, and it explains the structure of the data frame. Um, so we can actually try this and see what happens. So if I go down here and I say str of, uh, let's see, what was it, organism. Yeah, here we go. Okay, it says that I have a factor with four levels. And so here's my columns, and then this is sort of a detailed explanation of what's in each one. So anyway, those are some commands that we can use to, um, oh yeah, here we go. So I guess I must have uh, intended to talk about how you load data into data frames. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, so a CSV file is, a, is like the simplest, um, 
form of a file that you can store on a computer. Um, it's just basically text that is delimited by quotation marks and commas and things like that. So CSV actually stands for comma separated values. It simply means you have the text all in a row with commas in between it. And then at the end of each row, you go down to the next line. So it's a very, it's, it's a much simpler file format than Excel. And it's kind of the um, standard way to archive tabular data. You can actually make a CSV file from an Excel file by doing save as and then selecting CSV. And you can also load CSV files as uh, into Excel. Um, there's another form called TSV, which stands for tab separated values. It's also very popular. It's just like CSV, except each of the data items are separated by tab instead of by commas. So I'm not gonna belabor this too much other than to say that basically CSV is a file format where you can um, save tables. And if you want to load a table into a um, data frame, there is a command called read.csv, and it does exactly what you'd think. It reads a CSV file, and there are several different ways that you can use it. If you uh, pass in as a, an argument a, a path, like a, a Linux path, like a Unix path, like Max use, or a Windows path like Windows uses, it will read those files in. Um, these are full paths here. If, I, what, if the um, file is in the same directory that I'm running RStudio from, I don't have to put the path, I can just put the file name. Now, one of the problems is a lot of people um, don't really understand how to write file paths. So it turns out there's a convenient um, way to get around that, and that's to use another function called file.choose. And when you use file.choose um, before reading the file in, a little pop-up uh, file selection window comes up, and that allows you to basically navigate to the place where the file is. So if, you, um, you know, if you're writing a script for somebody else to use and you have no idea how their files are going to be organized, then this is a good choice because it allows them to just navigate and find wherever they put the file. The downside of it is if you run a script over and over again, it's annoying because every single time you run the script, you have to go through this file choosing um, uh, procedure and that becomes time consuming and annoying. One of my personal favorites is the third option, which is just to put the CSV file somewhere online. And then instead of putting a file path, you can actually put a URL of where the file is. And the good thing about that is that any, as long as the file is freely available on the internet, anybody who has your script can load it. So on a lot of the examples I give you, I've just pushed the CSV file up into GitHub. And then if you run the script, you'll be able to get it just as I can through the URL. Um, there's a couple more details, which again, I'm not gonna belabor that much. Um, these are technical things about like that uh, you can control whether the CSV file has a header row or not. Um, you can also use like if it's tab separated instead of comma separated, you can, you can uh, also include that. Uh, okay, so let's stop with that for right now and go back to the script. Okay, so I'm not going to... Um, run these two lines here because I actually don't even know if this file exists on my computer. But I will go ahead and run the file choose version and you'll see, uh, okay, yeah. So here you see the um, file selection dialog has popped up on my computer. And then I can go through and I don't know, oh, here's a CSV file, let's open that one. Okay, so it has just loaded uh, that file as my data frame, if we want to see what's in it, this is what's in it. Okay, uh, now I'm going to actually overwrite what is in my data frame by loading it from this URL here. And if, so if you're go doing this along with me, um, just forget about running these first three example lines and you can just run the third one. And what it'll do is um, read 
in the same file that everybody is going to be using. So if we want to look and see what the data frame is, this is a data file um, that has some imaginary heights of men and women. I think these are, these might actually be real data. I'm not sure. So on the left column, we have whether the height is of a man or a woman. And then the right column, we have the height in centimeters. So if we want, so here are these shortcuts I told you. Um, if you want to see just the first three lines, uh, sorry, the first six lines, you can do head. If you want to see the last six line, you can do tails. If you want to see the names of the columns, you can do names. And if you want to see the structure, you can do str. Okay, so that's just a kind of a little quick orientation to um, data frames, which as I said, are like the most common way of getting data in. So essentially anybody who has data in an Excel file can read it in um, using these commands here. So that um, catches me, catches us up to where I was hoping to be at the end of last week. Um, and the beginning of this week's new material is a couple other things that go along with what I um, just got done saying, which is with regards to loading um, CSV files. So let's see here, let's go back to the script. So I mentioned that, um, that uh, you have this problem of not knowing how to write the path for where a file is. There, is a, um, there are two commands that you can give in R, setwd and getwd. And what setwd does is it allows you to set the working directory uh, of where it's going to find files. And um, so it, this gets you around this issue that I said of like, if you use the choose file dialog, you have to keep doing that. So, you, so essentially, if you have a script that someone else has written, you can, and it uses set working directory, you can just go in and hack this particular line for the place where you want to keep your files. If you want to know what the current working directory is set for, you can use the get wd command. So when I run that, I can see that it's basically set for my user directory, which I think is often the default. But if I wanted to change it to something else, I could use this command. The other thing that I wanted to mention, just a moment ago, I said um, that CSV files are like a really common way of, of storing tabular data. But as we know, everybody also uses Excel a ton. So there is actually a library called Open XLSX, which um, isn't a part of like the standard Python library, but it's a library that you can open. And that provides additional commands that allow you to read Excel files directly in as a data frame. So if uh, you're going to do that, this is the format that you use. And CSV files can only have a single table, but as you probably know, Excel files can have a table on every sheet of the of the file and so you can actually specify which one of the sheets in the excel spreadsheet that you want to use um, and if you wanted to do file choose you can do that with the excel command as well so hopefully i've given you like a million and one different ways basically to load data frames because as i sh you know you can build your own data frames kind of manually, but like realistically, most people are going to take data that they have, uh, you know, from their, from other work that's in a spreadsheet and load it that way. All right, so I am going to um, clear my environment and get rid of all this junk and also clear this so that I have kind of a fresh start. Um, so what I wanted to talk about um, today is um, basically some simple analyses that you can use with, use with data. But before I launch into that, I wanna take just a minute and check whether anybody has uh, any questions. And I can see I forgot to make the 
chat show up? Ah, okay, there's nothing in the chat. That's good. Okay, so if anybody has any questions about what I talked about so far, I'm, I'm gonna pause for just a moment and give you a chance to unmute and ask me, or you can type it in the chat box if you want. Hey, Steve. I tried to run the library open XLX command and mm -hmm. it gives me an error. Yes, so um, if you um, do not already have that library installed, then you have to install it. So I think we talked about this early on. There's two ways you can do it. You can give the command or you can go to the package manager um, tab here. So um, if you, the, it defaults to um, showing you what packages you already have. And if you, uh, oh rats, let's see, I have people's faces in the way and I can't see. So if I type in, um, uh, let's see, what's it called? Open XLSX. Oh, look at that. I don't have it either. So, okay, let's see if I can reproduce your error by clicking on this. Actually, I'll do this one. Run. Yep, it doesn't know what's going on. So <clears throat> what I need to do is I need to install that. And so on the screen share that you see, do you see me moving the little box with the users on it around? Yes. No. Do you see me moving the Zoom, the chat window now? No, the chat window is not. Yeah. Okay. All right. So <laughs> it's a little hard to know what you're seeing and what you're not seeing. Okay. Well, I moved that out of the way. So if I click on the install uh, button here, here, then I can type in open. Okay. So there it is. Open XLSX and click on that. And then I can say install. And what it should do. Now you can see, uh, let's move this out of the way. It's gone through and done the install stuff. And actually doing it with the graphical interface is doing, it's actually running the command, the same command that you could run down here in the console window. You could type install.packages, open XLSX, and it would be the same thing as using the graphical interface. So now if I go here and tell it to run this command, uh, what? Hmm. Oh, I didn't load. Okay, so I installed it, but I didn't load it. I never ran this library command. So if I do that, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, I don't know what's wrong here. Um, I'll have to mess around with this. And uh, I mean, we just installed it, so it should be fine. I don't know why it's not opening it. But like I said, uh, so has it, did anybody else? do the installation and then try giving this library command like I did here. Mine installed, okay, and it seems to be working. Yeah, uh, so I have basically broken my RStudio install um, with some things that I did before and like I can't open Tidyverse, which everybody else can, so I don't know if that's a problem or if it's something else. But. All right, anyway, hopefully you get the idea of how to, uh, if, if it complains when you try to load a library that it doesn't know that what that package is, you can just go through the installation process and then try again. All right, um, other questions? Okay, uh, well, I'm going to just go ahead and march on. As I said before, if you have questions, you can just write them in the chat. And now that I have the chat turned on, I will actually notice them. So um, what I want to do is talk about um, some basic, uh, basics. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of three typical analyses that you might want to do. The, the first one would be to just get data about a vector of things. So all of the kind of like standard statistical things that you do, like getting counts and means and things like that. Um, and then I want to talk about analyzing two continuous variables by a regression and then one discontinuous and one continuous variable, which would be like the example would be t-test. And then also show you how you can make 
appropriate visualizations for those, which would be like a scatter plot, an XY scatter plot, and a bar plot. So these are kind of like the simplest things that you'd want to do in terms of stats. And as I mentioned, R was basically built for doing stats. So this is just kind of a demo of that. So what I'm going to do is start by loading this data, which is the school's data that, um, that we are actually going to play around with quite a bit. And so if I look at the school's data, I can see that there's a bunch of columns here about Metro Nashville schools. Like for each school, what is its name? What's its school ID? How many fifth graders does it have? How many people with limited English proficiency does it have? And then also the latitude and longitude that it's located in. So it's actually, it's a pretty comprehensive, um, uh, okay, click on the wrong thing. A pretty comprehensive uh, set of data about Nashville schools. So um, it's very simple to um, get a histogram of items that are in a particular vector. So remember that I said you can consider a column in a table to basically be a vector. So if I put the name of the data frame, which is school's data, a dollar sign, and then economically disadvantaged, um, then uh, it will basically pull that column out and treat it as a vector and then make a histogram of counting basically how many times different categories sell in it. So this is the first time we've actually seen something showing up in the plots window. So this or the plots pane. This pane down here is sort of a general purpose pane where uh, we can do different things like load packages and mess around with files, but it is also the place where um, simple graphics are displayed. So it's uh, basically gone through and, um, and taken the number of economically disadvantaged students in each school and counted how many schools there are that have that uh, number of students in that range. This is actually a pretty dumb graph to make because it doesn't take into consideration anything about like how, the size of the school. So it would be nice if we could actually normalize this by the side, size of the school and look at what percentage of the students are economically disadvantaged, but we can try doing that later. Um, also, I think I said early on that um, that uh, you can find the link, uh, how many items there are in a vector by doing its length. So if I do um, length, then it will um, it will say it will count how many rows there are, or how many items there are in the vector, which would be the rows. So there's 169, and then this, uh, oh yeah, let's see. There's a, I made this mistake last time and never fixed it. I can't, re I, I made a mistake on the way to find the number of rows in a data frame and I've forgotten what that mistake was. So we'll just skip that for now. But I can also calculate the mean. I can, uh, oh, that's interesting. It didn't work. So based on what I said last time, does anybody remember or, or can anybody think of why it failed to give me the mean for economically disadvantaged? Let's go and look at that row. So if I look at economically disadvantaged, uh, hmm. was it because of missing data or? Yeah, there should be at least one row that has a missing data value in it. And I'm not seeing it right now. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, oh, one of the other things I didn't say is that um, when you do the import process to read in a CSV file, there are certain um, conventions that it does. Like for example, if a cell is empty, it will change it. It will not read it in as like an empty string. It'll actually read it in as a, um, as a missing data. So I'm not actually seeing where the row is with the missing data in it, but uh, that clearly is the problem. And so 
I, I think, as I said before, this is kind of a safety device to prevent you from accidentally calculating something when some of your missing uh, values are there. So, or sorry, when some of the values are missing. And so we can, um, by using this function, by passing the vector, which is basically the column here, through this na.omit function, then what it will do is basically calculate the mean as if the missing values were not there. So if you're okay with there being missing values and you just want it to do a function anyway, you can use this na.admit thing and then it'll go through and calculate it that way. And the same thing is true for standard deviation. It doesn't like it because of the missing values, but if I tell it to omit the missing values, then it'll go ahead and calculate it. Okay, so those are just some like really basic things that you can do. Um, and, uh, but they're, I guess that you wouldn't really say they fall into the category of uh, analysis. So for analysis, usually we wanna look for like the relationship between two different variables. Um, so like in this case, it might be the uh, relationship between um, two of the different columns. Now, let me go back here to my PowerPoint. Okay, so we talked about that. Um, okay, so the simplest way to look at the relationship between two variables is to do um, this function called a plot. And the um, argument that gets passed into the function uh, has a format that we're going to see a number of times. You'll see the name of one data structure and then a tilde and then the name of another one. And so typically, uh, well, the, the dependent variable for whatever kind of thing we're doing usually comes first and then the independent variable comes second. So like if you're thinking in terms of X and Y, you put the Y, then you put a tilde, and then you put the X. So that's the typical format. And we'll see this in uh, other functions as well. Okay, so let's go back here. Okay, so um, I mentioned that um, we have this problem of, um, it being kind of stupid, like we saw in this histogram, to actually um, be taking raw counts. Because like, you know, if there's 10 students in a school that only has 20 students, that's pretty big. But if there's 10 students in a school with 1,000 students, that's pretty small. So what would really be great would be to be able to normalize this by the number of students in the school. Unfortunately, there isn't any column here that has the, um, the total number of students but since they don't count like non-gender binary uh, or yeah non-gender binary students they basically categorize them as all male and female so we can calculate the number of the total number of students by just adding up the um the the item in the male column with the item in the female column and as you may recall um, if I bring out the male column using the dollar sign notation, it's essentially going to treat the male column as a vector and the female column as a vector. And if I add those two vectors together, it's just going to do a pairwise addition of each, each male item in a certain row with each female item in a certain row. And then it's going to output the sum in a, another item in a third vector where the relative positions of all of the sums that I'm putting in that vector are in the same rel relative positions as all of the, um, the values in the row. So um, that's what I'm gonna do right here. So here you can see I'm calling out the male column and basically turning that into a vector, the female column and basically turning that into a vector, do the pairwise addition and then take that result and put it in a column or, or in a vector called total students. 
So as long as I'm, all of these operations that I'm doing are on columns in this table, then all the vectors are going to have the same length and, they're, and all of the order of the items in the vectors will be in the same order. So I'm essentially doing this operation, whatever operations I do on every row in the column uh, in consecutive, you know, in the appropriate order. So if I do total students, all right, I can look up here and I see it's added up the total number of students and there's a whole bunch of them, 169 values for each of the rows. Now I'm in a position where I can calculate the, the uh, fraction of students. So if I want like the fraction of students that are limited English proficiency, I can just take that column and divide by the total number of students. And because this total number of students vector has the same number and order of items as this column, I can just, just do a simple division and it'll go through and divide every item in those two vectors. So let's try that. And you can see over here that uh, I, I have a fractional number for that. And I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do the same thing for economically disadvantaged. That also gives me a fraction. So now it makes a little bit um, more sense to, um, to compare those two things um, by, uh, uh, by their fraction as opposed to the absolute numbers. So um, if I do a histogram for this, um, now you can see over here, that makes a little more sense. It's, uh, it's more of a bell-shaped curve than the other one because we're really seeing um, essentially normalizing this value by the size of the school. And so we've taken out the, the fact that some schools are bigger than others. Um, okay, so that's great. That's exactly what we wanted to do. So now if we want to actually uh, sort of investigate, so, so you might think, hey, maybe, um, maybe there's some kind of relationship between economic, being economically disadvantaged and having limited English proficiency. So the way I've organized it here, I, I'm pretending that the dependent variable is fraction economically disadvantaged. So, so we could have sort of the hypothesis that if your English isn't very good, it might make you economically disadvantaged. Now, we could also think of it as the other way around, like maybe if you're economically disadvantaged, you don't have the opportunity to learn English or something like that. So we really are looking at more of a correlation, not cause and effect. But let's go ahead and make this plot. And so now if we look over here, we can see um, that I've made an XY scatter plot. Wow, I would say there's not really much of a relationship here. Okay, now how do I move this out of the way? Oh, okay, getting used to the zoom thing. So it does not look like there's a very clear relationship between these two things at all. Um, in fact, it doesn't really look at all like it's linear even. Um, but if we wanted to evaluate this relationship, it's actually pretty easy to do a linear regression uh, in R. So let's just jump back to the slides here. Um, the way that you carry out a linear regression is uh, two steps. So the first thing that you do is you create what's known as a linear model. Um, and notice that the format here is the same as what we did for the plot where you put the, uh, ind the, the dependent variable, a tilde, and then the independent variable and you run this linear model function on it, and then it creates a data object called a model. So that model by itself um, maybe doesn't make a lot of sense, but we can do several things with that model. So for example, if we say a B line model, it will graph a trend line through the data. Also, we can do other things like summary. It'll give us things like the slope and the intercept and values and things like that. And then the last thing, which we're not actually going to do right now, but this is the way you run more complicated linear modeling tests like analysis of variance. So these are all things that you can do with the model once you've created it. 
So let's go back to the example. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, this um, participants bar is annoying, <laughs> keeps getting in the way. Okay, so let's go ahead and run the linear model. And you can see nothing visible happen. But now if I say, if I just give the command model, what it'll do is give me a brief summary of the results. Basically, it'll tell me the slope and the intercept. So that's essentially the slope and intercept of this line here. You can see the slope is almost zero because there's, as I said, there's not really any relationship between these two factors. Um, if I want it to draw the best fit line, I can do AB, mod, uh, AB line model. And now you see um, it has done the best fit line through the scatter plot, which is a useful thing. And um, I can also have it do more extensive statistics than what I get by just having it print uh, the result of model. So if I say summary of the model, then I get a huge amount of information. I get um, I get uh, the um, an estimate of the slope, just as I did before, an estimate of the intercept. But I also get p values for each of them. So like, is the intercept significantly different from zero and is the slope significantly different from zero? So this is like a really pretty useful thing. It basically tells us what we could tell with our eyeballs, which is there's no, there's no significant relationship between these two variables, assuming that one is cause and the other is effect. And then the other thing that's useful down here is the R squared. That tells you basically how tight the relationship is around the line and you can see it's not very tight. A very tight relationship would have an R squared of one, and this is almost zero. So basically, there's no relationship that we can tell between these two things. All right. Um, now, in the script above, I basically was doing a bunch of things separately, but like if you were um, developing sort of like a pipeline, maybe you had a lot of data that you had to analyze and um, and you didn't want to do all of those steps separately then um, you could uh, run them all at once so what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to delete everything so we can pretend like we're coming in with a fresh um, like we just started working for the day so here's basically my pipeline that reads in the data, does all these various calculations, runs a linear model, and then gives us, uh, runs a linear model, makes a plot, and puts a line on it, and gives us a summary all at once. And so if I just highlight this whole block of code and run it, then bam, it does the whole thing. It makes my nice little plot with the trend line down here, and it gives me all of my statistics that I ask for. So, um, so, this is essentially an R script where we have a bunch of things that we're all doing at one time. Okay, so I'm going, to, we're almost out of time here, but I'm going to go ahead and start talking about factors. Um, we have to understand a little bit about factors in order to, um, to understand how to do the second kind of test that I was talking about. So in this example, the x value and the y value were both continuous numbers. But what if you have, what if the x value is a category of things? And so in order to talk about that, we have to talk about factors. So factors are basically what you use in R to categorize data. Um, and this the, the term factor basically comes from the experimental design uh, world. And so a, cat a category is uh, basically a thing that you use to divide an experiment uh, up into different treatments. And each kind of experimental trial that you can have is called a, a level. So um, if you have a factor, uh, so like in the example of the table that we were looking at 
before with the heights of men and women, uh, the sex or gender is a factor. And then the two levels would be male or female. So the categories are essentially the levels. In um, some other statistical software, this is also called grouping variables um, because it's essentially the way that you uh, can group, place things into groups so that you can run an analysis on it. And so the reason why um, factors are present in R, again, it comes out of sort of this historical orientation that R has towards statistics. And so a lot of the statistical tests that you run require that the things that you are, are that the categories that you're testing by are uh, in the form of factors. So here's a very simple example. I used to um, teach biology and I judged a lot of science fairs. And so this is like a very typical science fair project. Somebody takes some bean seeds and then they plant them and they put a lot of water on some of them and they put like hardly any water on other ones. And then they try to see like, did it make a difference in how they grow? So in this example, water would be a factor. And then the two levels would be wet or dry. So this is basically the two different categories under which I carried out my experiment. And then the height observations are the things that I'm actually trying to group. So in, in my analysis, I would wanna see if the heights that are in the wet category are different from the heights that are in the dry category. So if I wanted to do this, um, I could, uh, do it sort of like the manual way that I talked about before. So I could create, use the construct function to make a vector that has um, all the wet and dry values, and then another vector that has the height values. But the problem is if I just create a vector um, using wet, 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 dry, wet, it's going to read them in as string values, but not as actual factors. If I want them to be factors, I have to basically turn this character vector into a factor by running it through this factor functions. Um, so let's go ahead. I think I have this in the code here. So let's try this. So here, if I say, um, oh, let's see, actually, let me clear this out first. Too much junk. Okay, so if I run this, it says it is a character vector of wet, wet, dry. And if I run this, it says it's a numeric vector of 25, 21, etc. If I turn the water conditions vector into a factor, then watch what happens. Now, the description over here in the environment is different. It says it's a factor with two levels, wet and dry. So I've essentially done magic here saying that these are, this is not just a generic vector of character um, items, but this is actually, actually has a special meaning. It means I can um, characterize, I can use it to divide things up into groups. So if I just have it display the different things, notice down in the terminal here, I'm having it display the water conditions vector. But if I have it display the factors, it not a, it lists the items without quotation marks and then says levels wet and dry. So if you're ever confused about is something a factor or is it just a a, um, a bunch of character items in a vector, the key thing to look for is that it'll say levels and then you'll know that it's actually a factor. So um, I think I will um, call it quits for right now because it's two o'clock. Um, and if you want to go ahead and run this code here, um, you can do that. It basically uh, shows you how to, um, how to um, make a bar plot and then also to do a, um, a t-test on the data. So when we start up next time, we'll, um, We'll run through that, but you should be able to play around with this um, yourself. If you're really into stats, 
Um, there's also an extension about how to do it in Nova if you have more than two categories. But since that's kind of a more advanced statistical topic, I'm not going to really go into that. But if you're if you're a stats person or you do a lot of uh, analysis, you are welcome to uh, do that on your own. So I am going to, at this point, stop recording, but I'm going to go ahead and stay online after I stop the recording. And then if people have questions, I kind of was flying through this, they'll give you an opportunity to, um, to ask some questions before we all leave.